Um, Roxana and I had this idea to do this presentation tonight to kind of just put it out there because each year we have a handful of athletes that are thinking about leveraging athletics as a way to um, get into college and also to kind of use that as a main activity when they do enter college. And so what I hope to accomplish tonight is giving you some practical steps to get started on your journey. Okay, and, and how to kind of start this recruiting process. And two, give you the overview of college athletics in terms of levels, divisions, eligibility, and, and what you need to know um, academic wise before you enter into the athletic recruiting. So this presentation is kind of divided up into two parts. But I will say one of the greatest things about college athletics being both a, an athlete, I was a student athlete in college, I coached at the collegiate level, and then after I got out of college coaching, I worked um, with athletes at the high school level, and I was a club, club coach as well. So I've kind of seen athletics from all of these different realms. And I will say that it really adds an amazing experience to your college experience because you go in to school with a group, a community of however many players, and they become your lifelong friends. So I'm a huge advocate of, you know, if you can play sports in college, it is just a great way to build your community community from the start. Um, and I hope you guys know that this evening is really about the recruiting process as a whole, but going into this, knowing that if there's a will, there's a way. Okay, there are so many different ways to get involved in athletics in college that if you want it, you can definitely make it happen. So let's jump right in. I kind of feel like I'm preparing for a game right now. So I'm getting excited to share this information with you. First and foremost, I want you to know that getting recruited and applying to college or being a collegiate athlete is actually two simultaneous processes, right? You're researching and applying to colleges on one end, and you're actually researching and working to get recruited on the other end. And one of the things that I often tell students, student athletes or prospective student athletes to think about is, do I have the athletic ability to play at the college level? And most likely you do, because there are so many different levels. But the second part is, do you have the desire to play at the college level? It is a big commitment, but it's an amazing commitment. Um, and, and one that I think is super fulfilling if you're able to um, look at it as a way to grow and challenge yourself and get connected in your community. So you have to really ask yourself, do I have the desire to play at the college level? And am I willing to put in the work to actually get recruited? <clears throat> because it is a lot of work because you are doing um, two simultaneous possible uh, processes. But I want to let you know that if I have one message here before you start with the recruiting process is to really get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Just like when you start at new, uh, your sport and you're learning a new skill or you're learning a new swim stroke or you're learning a new football pattern play, it's really uncomfortable. It's hard to kind of imagine those things. Um, but once you start to get the hang of it, and once you start being okay with being uncomfortable, things get easier. So the more that you practice this, the better it gets. You are really, a 16, 15, 16, 17 year old person driving this process. And you have to talk to adults and advocate for yourself and reach out to coaches and do all of these things that are really hard to do. But the sooner that you accept that and realize that you have the ability to grow and change as an athlete and really gain so much out of this process, the, the better and easier this process can be. And it's actually a ton of fun. You get to meet a whole bunch of different people you get to travel, you get to play your sport. So really, I think even though it is a lot of work, it is definitely worth the reward. So let's talk a little bit about 
the three phases of recruiting. I like to break this down into three different phases because I think it's easier to understand what you need to do at each phase, okay? And um, I think the first phase is really identifying the level of play that you feel that you can participate in and also being aware of the college research. So. You may hear terms tonight, NCAA versus NAIA, division one, two, and three. We're gonna go over all of that. But I, the other thing that I want you to think about is identifying your college values. So even before you decide, am I a division one player, division two player, division three player, you actually have to think like, where do I wanna be? Where do I see myself? Could I see myself you know, going to college in the Midwest, the East Coast? And that's why we're also encouraging you to you know, do things like read the FISC guide and complete college research in addition to knowing what is my athletic level? Can I participate at the highest level or am I looking more at like D2, D3? Or am I you know, able to play at the highest level but, and, and, and be able to do that, but I want more balance so I'm gonna decide on division three. And then you're going to connect with coaches and determine your level of play. So we're doing all of that in the first phase, and that's going to set us up for phase two, which is really about organiza organization and gathering information and really starting to initiate that context or contact. In this phase, you're building a balanced list of schools. Just like you have academic reaches, targets, and likelies, you're gonna have athletic reaches, targets, and likelies. You're gathering coach contact information. You're getting organized. You're reaching out via email, putting your data together so that you can put your best foot forward and give out the information that you need in order for coaches to know who you are and identify you as a prospective student athlete. And then in the third phase, you're building these relationships and starting to narrow down your college choices. This is the phase where I feel like students, athletes actually feel like they're getting recruited because you get to know these coaches, you get invested in the players, you're, you're just narrowing down that list a little bit and finding the fit. And eventually you're determining where you want to go. So if I can say anything about these three phases is absorb as much knowledge as you can. Don't just think because you have one school in your head that that's your only option. There are so many different schools out there to choose from. And I think the other piece is, is be flexible and be open to different ideas and be open and coachable. I think all of those things in this phase are really, really important to remember. So we're gonna break down these three phases of recruiting in a little bit. First and foremost, I think it's really, if I'm giving an overview of college athletics here, right, which is one of the things that was, was talking about in the beginning, um, is that, it's broken down by NCAA and, and NAIA, and there's also club. So I'm gonna start with NCAA division one schools first and kind of give you an overview of what those look like and then work our way down. As I work through these slides or these sections, this doesn't mean that division one is the most competitive level and then club is the least competitive level, right? All of these levels can be equal in, in competition. As a college coach at the division three level, we play division two teams that we beat. As a division two player, we played division one schools that we beat. They were equally strong. It's just really more about the balance, the time commitment, and what, what schools can give you scholarship wise, right? And how many schools there are and the funding. So division one has 300, NCAA division one has 351 D1 colleges. Yes, they have athletic scholarship and their scholarships are gonna be more robust. So they might have a fully funded team where for example, volleyball has um, 11 scholarship players on their team or full scholarships. And they may just decide to break them up or to give them just to 11 players. However, I will say that in the division one, this is the biggest time commitment. It's a year round commitment. A lot of times student athletes stay on campus in the summer to train. You have off season conditioning, you're waking up early, conditioning with the team, you have a spring season and a fall season. So it's going to be a year round commitment. 
in division one athletics, you are an athlete first and a student second. So you're working your academic schedule around anything to do with athletics. They have a ton of support for you, um, but it is going to be basically your life and your job when you're on that campus. Um, and I should just clarify that, you know, Division One offers athletic scholarships except for the Ivies. So if you're applying to Ivy League schools, you can expect you're not going to get um, athletic scholarships because they are not available. Division Two, there's 308 Division Two colleges, um, and those offer athletic scholarships. Academically, typically, not all, but typically, Division Two colleges are are not as strong academically. When you think about the breakdown, and I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. Um, it might still be a year round commitment. So you might still have a fall and a spring season or a longer season, but it's a shorter time commitment. They have rules in place that make your seasons shorter, make your off season shorter and your practice time or in one-on-one uh, -on -one coach time shorter. There, I think you're an athlete and a student. There's definitely more balance at, at the division two level than at the division one level. NCAA Division III, there's 443 Division III colleges. Here, there are no scholarships athletically, but about 80% of student athletes that participate at the Division III level are, are offered some sort of merit aid. So even though they can't support you with athletic scholarships, the admissions and coaches work together to offer you um, most of the time some sort of merit or academic money. Here is the most balanced. You're a student first and then an athlete second. And it's definitely a shorter time commitment. So if you're thinking you want the full college experience where you're able to join Greek life or study abroad or you know participate in internships and not have your schedule impacted, division three might be the way to go. And then NAIA is, is a different organization or association outside of NCAA, um, which only houses about 60,000 athletes. Uh, they have athletic scholarships. There's D1 and D2 NAIA schools. But again, you're, you're going to be a student first and athlete second. Um, and it is a little bit shorter of a time commitment. So it's not as rigorous as maybe a Division I um, NCAA school. And then last but not least, we have some club teams. So most schools offer club. Um, and I want to keep that in mind because as you go through this process, your priorities may change, right? And that is completely okay. So sometimes students start off in this process and they have one dream. I'm going to go division one. I'm in it. I really want to do this. And then something happens midway through their season or they just decide, look, maybe this isn't for me. Then, then we kind of sw switch gears and say, okay, maybe you consider club. Let's look for intramurals. Let's make sure that that's available at your campus because the commitment's minimal. You're a student first. You don't need to work to get recruited. You can walk on and it could sometimes can be just as competitive as division three, II, division two, II, or division one. It's just not an NCAA recognized sport. So the message here being that just because there are different divisions, one, two, and three, or NAIA, does not mean that it's less competitive, right? The competition is still strong. You're still getting that, um, you know, you're still getting those game plays. You're still able to participate in athletics on your college campus. There's still a lot of school pride, but it might just be the level that you, that you feel most comfortable giving that time commitment. So I want to make sure that, that I hit that home for you all. Okay, so let's look at a few examples by of colleges by division. I tried to in the West Coast. All right, um, Division One, UCLA, UC Davis, Stanford. You know those are those are the big name schools. You see them on on Saturday football. Um, they're on TV. You hear them announced. All of these things. They're going to be you know your strong schools in the West that offer Division One sports. The highlighted schools are going to be Tier One and. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides, but academically for tier one, you need to be strong academically and athletically. So here's just a few examples of schools that are in the West Coast and what divisions they fall into. <clears throat> And 
And then there are example colleges of division uh, of uh, by division for the East Coast. So maybe some schools that you've never heard of, right? Lock Haven, East Jawsburg. I've heard of all of them because I played college athletics in, in um, Pennsylvania, and this was the Pennsylvania State Athletic League. Uh, so those were some fun schools that we got to play against. But um, you know, you see some of your Division three or the smaller liberal arts schools. That's going to be the case either on the West Coast or the East Coast. And then again, these highlighted schools are the ones that are these top tier academic schools. Okay, so just because you haven't heard of them doesn't mean that they're not reputable programs. There's just a lot of Division Three, Division Two, and Division One schools out there. So it's all the more um, reason to put your name out there and and start contacting coaches. All right. Tier one schools and the academic index. So I think when students start to um, think about where they want to get recruited or how they want to leverage their athletic ability, I feel like these tier one schools come up a lot, right? So they might say, hey, is there a way for me to use the fact that I'm a really good volleyball player to maybe get into UCLA or get into Harvard, right? And that is definitely a possibility. But I would say with the Ivy League schools, well, and for these schools that are on this list, academically, you also have to be very strong. So we're talking about an average GPA of a 3.8 unweighted. And we're talking about test scores that range in the 1430 plus range for the SAT and the 31 plus range for the ACT. Um, and I know test optional has come up and as, student, as more colleges move towards that, we're kind of watching that to see how that plays out with athletics. Um, NCAA is no longer using that measure this year at, as an eligibility indicator, but these are definitely something that schools and, and college coaches take into consideration. So one of the things that I think is really important to note here is that when you're actively getting recruited, what a college coach is doing is building a list of recruits that he or she knows or that they know um, that can be academically successful at their school and also athletically really successful. And then they kind of look at them and say, okay, who are my top recruits here? And, and then they go in and go to bat for them in admissions. So that's how you can kind of leverage that athletic ability uh, with the, the admissions ticket. So when I worked as a I, as a college coach, I had a list of students and I met with admissions weekly or every other week because my college was trying to grow the school via, through athletics. And I would say, okay, this person has this test score and this GPA, you know, where are they in terms of admission? And they would say, okay, Jenny, like this, this person looks good. That person looks good. And then I could know that if they, that they would academically fit that, that mold. And that's what these coaches are doing as as well as they're building their list of recruits, okay? You'll hear things like the Patriot League in Division One. they're gonna be really strong academically. Obviously the Ivy League is very strong academically. And then um, for Division Three, the NESCAC schools are a very academically driven school. We're talking acceptance rates in, in the teens or lower, right? Um, so you, you, you just have to make sure that you're you know, really good at your sport and that you're continuing to work with your, um, with your high school coaches and, and, and club coaches to get noticed and just doing the best that you can to get on these coaches radars. The other thing that the Ivy League schools do is they have an academic index, which essentially takes your test scores and your GPA and puts it into a little formula and then spits out a score. So the academic index runs from 237 to 240, that's exceptionally strong. So if a coach has a list of exceptionally strong recruits, they can plug for them in admissions. This is a great blog right here, which I put on our resources list. And I'm gonna give you all um, a, a web resources list here tonight. But if you wanna know what your um, 
academic index score is, you can just use this link, plug in your SAT or ACT and your GPA, and it will give you your academic index. Okay, so I, at the end of this, I'm going to send out um, information to you all with some resources, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that um, towards the end of the presentation. Okay. Okay, so then the next thing that you need to know in terms of, you know, these tier one schools, division one and division two, um, is that you have to be academically eligible and you have to be cleared by the NCAA that you are academically eligible. And you do that through the NCAA Eligibility Center. Okay, so you'll hear this NCAA Clearinghouse, it used to be called, but it's actually the NCAA Eligibility Center now. You have to have the academic standards for initial eligibility, which is these 16 core courses. Um, you have to graduate from high school. You have to complete a minimum of these 16 core courses and earn at least a 2.3, oops, sorry about that. Look, I'm going to the NCAA here, jump in the gun. Um, there we go. Hold on one second, sorry. Um, so, and you also have to be able to um, earn a minimum grade point average of a 2.3. So 16 core courses, minimum GPA of a 2.3, and earn a qualifying test score on either the SAT or the ACT. Now this year and next year, they have, you know, temporarily suspended the ACT or SAT requirement due to COVID. And they are also working on the pass fail classes due to COVID. So I know they are willing to work with you and work with your counselors to be able to make sure that you meet those qualifying things. But all you need to know is this 16 core courses, 9th, 10th, 11th grade, and, and through 12th grade, and the minimum GPA of a 2.3 or a qualifying test score, okay? Or otherwise, academically, you would be a red shirt. You can visit the NCAA Eligibility Center, you register there, and then you're going to send in a copy of your transcript after your sophomore year, again, after your junior year, and then as you graduate, you'll send a final transcript and your test scores to make sure that you qualify academically for Division One and Division Two levels. For Division three, this actually doesn't matter because they create their own standards in division three as to whether or not you're academically eligible for those schools. They also don't offer athletic scholarships, which is why there's no need to be eligible for the NCAA. Um, the only time that this ever really gets hairy for students is if you take summer school classes that aren't approved or you had to drop something or you're taking maybe CTE courses at your school that aren't necessarily approved. So I've also put the link to this NCAA approved course list at the bottom. So if you wanted to go and visit this and put in your school name, you can go ahead and research that to make sure that you're meeting those core requirements. If you're meeting the A through G requirements for the UCs, chances are you're meeting this minimum requirement as well. Okay, the next big thing, and this is different for every sport. Um, and I, I do wanna encourage you too, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we will be sure to address them at the end. I'll leave time for questions. I know we have some football, crew, swim, right? We have possibly some lacrosse, soccer. I'm trying to look and see who else is here. Football, crew, rowing, swim. Um, yeah, so we'll, I'll, I'll try to go through some of those uh, recruiting rules. You wanna make sure that before you get started, you're aware of the recruiting calendars. The NCAA puts up some guidelines for coaches as to when they can contact student athletes and when they are not allowed to contact student athletes. So you may go through this process and be sending out emails and talking to coaches and not hear any responses because of the timing of your, um, of your emails. And that's perfectly okay. That doesn't mean that you're not still doing the work. It's just really important to know um, that 
uh, that the recruiting calendars. So I'm giving you this resource. We're going to give you this resource at the end of our session. I'm going to email out a list of website resources, this NCAA college bound student athlete um, brochure, and then also an organizational Excel spreadsheet to keep you organized and ready to go. Um, those will be like our deliverables at the end of the session. So you're going to get these, this information. So you don't have to like manically screenshot things if, if you don't need to. Okay. Um, as you go through this document, <clears throat> It has common terms. It talks about eligibility. It tells you the sliding SAT score and GPA, right? But one of the best resources in here is on page 34, there's a, 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 is where the common terms are. So they have important rec recruiting terms like uh, contact period, dead period, evaluation, what is an official visit, right? They have all of those. And then they also have the recruiting calendar specific to your sport. So if we look at football division one, I know we have some football players in here, okay? You can call a coach at any time. You may receive camp brochures and NCAA materials and recruiting publications at any time. And a coach may begin sending you recruiting materials and electronic correspondence September 1st of your junior year in high school, right? But then a phone call from a coach, that coach can't contact you until between April 15th and May 31st in your junior year or beginning September and then beginning September 1st after of your senior year right? So they can have, you can have contact with them off campus beginning July 1 of your junior year or high school or opening day of classes, whichever comes first. And then it breaks down the official visits. So it's very specific here, right? You just want to be aware of these recruiting rules. Um, okay, so let's see with swim. Hold on. So all other sports, division one, they have baseball. So this would be my all other sports. You may receive brochures, camps, questionnaires, anything, NCAA materials, June 15th between your sophomore year and junior year in high school. Phone calls to a coach, you can begin doing that June 15th between your sophomore year and junior year in high school. And a coach may call you June 15th between your sophomore and junior year. So June 15th of sophomore year is a big time period for like swimming, diving, crew, all of those, all of those other sports. Um, June 15th sophomore year is when coaches can start contacting you, but you can still reach out to them. They just can't reach out back out to you. Okay. So that I think is just a really important piece of information as we move into the second part of actually getting started in the process of getting recruited, just to understand and know these rules. Okay. And again, I'm going to give you the eligibility center piece. And then recruiting timeline. Ideally, when students want to start, is during your sophomore year. If you look at those calendars, college coaches can start to talk to you September or June 15th most after your sophomore year. So we wanna prime them with all of your information previous to that phone call or previous to that reach out. Now, listen, this is a really important message. If you're a junior and you're listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, all is hope is lost. I haven't started this process yet. That, that is completely okay. You're just going to be on an accelerated timeline. As a field hockey coach, as a high school coach, and now as an academic or a college counselor, I have seen all types of recruiting scenarios play out, okay? I've had students who didn't reach out to coaches until their senior year and secured a spot on, on a team. I've had students that worked from sophomore year and, and secured a spot on a team. I've had students walk on. So there are uh, the recruiting process and path is different for every student athlete, and that's completely okay. I'm just setting this up saying, ideally, if you are able to start in January or February of your sophomore year, throughout March and April and into the summer, you're just going to have more opportunities and more time to be able to reach out more to more coaches. 
Okay. So sophomore year, it looks like you're sending emails to coaches. You're letting them know about your stats. You're letting them know how um, you're doing. And junior year, you're building relationships with college coaches. You go to see college teams play. You send your transcripts and test scores. You continue collaborating with your high school coaches and club coaches. And then maybe that at the end of that summer, you kind of have an idea of where you would want to be and start to narrow down that list and visit camps and clinics. And then as your senior year comes to, it comes into play, you're solidifying your college list, you're going on official visits, you're actually applying, you're deciding early decision options, and then you're reviewing packages. The other piece of this recruiting timeline that is a little sticky right now is that COVID has thrown everything for a loop, right? The NCAA just announced that seniors, um, that uh, college seniors can participate in another year of athletics because they they lost a whole year of eligibility due to COVID and the, the teams not being able to play. College coaches are behind the ball um, because they're trying to figure out what to do with their roster. And every day this COVID, you know, pandemic is evolving and changing how coaches are able to recruit. So if you're late to the game and you are needing to get started, all is not lost. We just have to accelerate the timeline a little bit and, and reach out to the colleges. Okay, so COVID's kind of impacted a lot of different things. So as I transition into um, from the overview of college athletics and what that looks like to now actually trying to get recruited, the best thing that I can tell you is to gather your team. You're going to need a support system and it definitely takes a village to get recruited. Even though you're in the center as the student athlete, um, and you're collaborating and you're driving this process, you need your high school and club coaches to help you identify your level of play, to increase your skill level, to get you into games, all of those things. You need your parents for support, guidance, to help drive you places, to pay for camps, to get you where you need to be. And you need your counselors to work with you on academic eligibility, making sure you're getting all, of, all that you need to the NCAA. Um, transcript wise, getting signed up for test scores. So it's going to take a team of people to get you there. But the idea here is that you are the one driving that process. So remember, if you have the athletic ability and you have the willingness to play in college and you have, the, it, you can find a way to do this. You just need a good team of people supporting you. Okay. So going back to phase one, identifying your college and athletic values. First, identify your college values. You, at the end of this, you want to have a strong education, right? And you want to be, you want to be educated in a way that feels right to you, right? So know about the size, the location, the major you were looking for in college. Use the FIS guide to research these schools and understand the environment to which you're applying, you know, and know about these schools inside and out. Observe games in your area and visit these schools. That's how you're going to identify your initial college values. Then you're actually going to look to your coaches and solicit feedback from them to help you identify your athletic ability. And you're not just going to use your high school and club coaches. You're also going to solicit feedback from these college coaches that are going to see you play over the next two years. So again, getting comfortable with being a little uncomfortable and asking for feedback from these people. So I highlighted in red, like maybe you would be a lower division one player, a high division two and a high division three player, right? And there's varying levels throughout each division, right? So if you identify your top third, your middle third and your lower third, you're essentially knowing which, um, which, which schools are gonna be athletic reaches, which schools are gonna be athletic targets, which schools are gonna be athletic likelies, okay? The other way to note, or, and then what I suggest you do is going to the actual rankings on NCAA.com and know who is strongest in those areas. 
So they have them broken down by regional rankings. So I'm just using volleyball as an example here. But if you look at the regional rankings for volleyball and say you want to know who's the best division three schools in the West, because you can play at that high level, you're going to look on the West Coast and see that these are the top eight schools in the West Coast for volleyball. So maybe you target those, okay? Then you say, maybe you consider, I would go to New York or I wanna look in New England. You can probably play at these levels too, right? Because you've been identified, you talk to your coaches, they know that this is the level that you're gonna play at. If we switch this to say division one, and you look at the rankings for division one, these top 20 schools, have their pick of the litter, right? So I would suggest, I would probably say that if you were on these people's radar, you would already know this, right? And, and they would be reaching out to you and they would be finding you because you would probably be on some kind of national team that's recognized. And, and that's where these people are pulling their athletes from. Doesn't mean that the top 20 is not possible, but just knowing that this top 20 schools, they might not be in your division one wheelhouse. So you're gonna have to look elsewhere to figure out which, which rankings are, are meant for you. So that's NCAA.com. There's also NCAA.org. And I find that NCAA.org is really helpful in building your college list by sport. So say if you don't know where to start or who has your school, your sport that you're thinking about playing, I would start with NCAA.org to start building your list of schools. I'm sorry, I mean, I'm going back and forth between our presentation. I just want to make sure that I show you these awesome resources that you'll also get at the end um, via email. Okay, so here you can go to ncaa.org. All right, and then you're going to click. Um, let me just go back so you can see where I clicked. I clicked on list of NCAA school and conference athletic websites sorted alphabetically by sport. What a mouthful. This is located under the About Us tab. And then you just simply click here and you can actually sort by division, by state and by sport. This is your single best tool when trying to find a list of colleges. So if you wanted to say, I need division three schools in California that offer football, for example. So let me just grab football. Here it is. And then you click on view institutions. Here are all the division three schools in California that offer football, okay? And you can see there's Claremont McKenna, there's Pomona Pitzer, University of the Redlands, Whittier. But I think you can go through and put all of these schools on your, on your list. And you can search by region, which I think is super helpful. NAIA also has a very similar um, program. So if you click on this bottom link here, you can select and view institution by, by sport and divisions as well. Okay. All right. So that's phase one. You're basically building a college list. You're knowing about your college values and you're getting that information down into a spreadsheet where you can get organized and gather even more information. So as you move into phase two, you identify the size, location, the major, the value, you identify whether your, your academic fit, reach target and likely. Now you're gonna look at your athletic fit, reach target and likely, okay? And you're gonna get organized and put a list of schools together. I would put the coach's name, the coach's email, the coach's cell phone number, and then also whether or not you filled out the athletic questionnaire. I'm gonna show you where to find those. And then I would also keep track of when you contact that person so that you can look through and realize, oh, I haven't reached out to them in two months. I should probably keep them updated because I was MVP of this tournament, right? Um, 
I think it's good to visually to break this down athletically as reaches. So if Claremont McKenna was one of those top volleyball schools and it was athletically a reach and it's academically a bit of a reach for you, it's just good to know that going into it. And then you have some academic targets and likelies that are also athletic target targets. And then in green, you have um, athletic likely and then there's a, a reach academically, but you might be able to play at Caltech. So that's the way that I would divide, you know, divide this up. And I do have this spreadsheet for you as a deliverable at the end of this session as well, just for attending tonight. So phase two, you're getting organized and you're gathering more information. One of the ways to get organized is to actually create an athletic resume. You want to be sure that you have the pertinent information on there for the college coaches. You're doing this athletic resume so that when you contact coaches, they can quickly see how tall you are. You know, they can look at your stats. They know whether or not you are right-handed or left-handed. They know your vertical leap. They can see your GPA and test scores. They know what high school you play for, your experience, your club coaches, right? And they have that information. Now, in a world of COVID, where you guys haven't been competing in a while, some of these stats might be out of date, right? And, and you're waiting for your upcoming season to be able to update that resume. And and that is completely okay. One of the greatest tools that you can use at this point, if you've been practicing, is this coach or evaluator comment down here. So you can see um, they solicited feedback from their coaches. Cindy has established herself as a talented volleyball player against some of the best competition in Southern California region, right? And then it's it's especially enjoyable to watch her high level of success in the classroom and it's reflected in her exceptional volleyball playing, right? That sounds like a kid that I would want to recruit. So if you're close with your high school coaches or your club coaches, soliciting this comments or this feedback at the bottom would be really, really helpful to you, okay? So if you're not sure what to put on this athletic resume and you're just getting started, like you're not sure crew wise, what do I put in here? Do I put my best times? Do I put my PRs? Do I put individual races and team races? How do I go about doing that? I would look for the online questionnaire at a few colleges and see what they ask. I'm pulling up volleyball just because I went with the volleyball theme here tonight, but here's UCLA's um, athletic questionnaire. You can Google this by and just put in the chat or put in the search bar athletic questionnaire for volleyball, this college, and it should come up. Or if you just go to the athletic website, you'll be able to find the questionnaire. There's personal information, parent information, um, your academic information, your club information, your athletic information. They're looking for reach, approach, block, what handed. They also look for your other college preferences. They're looking at your positions and then they have some other questions that you would want to answer as well. So really important that you check out what kind of stats they're looking for because it's different for every sport. Okay, so if the resume is what you're doing to introduce yourself, creating a recruiting video is probably going to be your single best tool in this recruiting process. And it doesn't have to be crazy or flashy. Um, I, DVDs, I think, are going out of, are, are kind of going by the wayside. Some people may still request them, but you can actually upload all of your videos onto a YouTube link. And I think that's going to be your most successful piece. There are people that specialize in this. You can have some Somebody help you make a recruiting video. Um, and I think that would be really useful so that you just get your best clips on, on camera. But a recruiting video, a strong one, will have a title page with your name, address, your class, your email, coach name, contact information, and positions. It'll be up there for 30 to 45 seconds. Then you'll do a one to two minute introduction where the player talks about themselves, mentions hobbies, talks about positions, why they want to play in college right? Then you'll have five to seven minutes of individual skills that showcase your game and, not, and that, that aren't able to be showcased in a game, okay? Maybe it's individual shooting, defense, rowing technique, 
swimming, if you're doing diving, specific dives, if you're a football player, passes or routes that you're running, right? Um, any of those types of things, 1v1 skills that would be really important, um, swimming technique and strokes, all of those things could go into that individual skills game minute, that individual skills. And then gameplay. Um, for swimming, I don't think you would really much need to put, you know, your swim meets on there because the times are everything and you're going to be putting up, putting your times on there and, and that will be probably the best for them. But for the other athletes, you know, soccer and football, gameplay is really important. So five to seven minutes of highlights of the athlete's best play. Make sure they know your number, make sure they know what jersey you're in, what color, and maybe even having an arrow or a circle pointing to where you are in the field so they can keep an eye on you and coaches aren't searching for that, okay? But your recruiting video is gonna be one of your best tools. So initially, you might cast a wide net and you might put a list of 60 to 70 colleges on your spreadsheet and email 60 to 70 college coaches, unless you're a sport like crew or, you know, water polo that maybe only 41 to 50 schools offer, then you're going to be emailing a little bit less. Okay. But for sports like soccer, baseball, football, um, you may end up emailing lacrosse 60 to 70 different college coaches because you're trying to put out into the universe who you are and what you stand for and your athletic ability, you may only get about 10 to 15% of a response rate from coaches. And I would say that would be really successful. You're going to keep the positive responses. You're going to start to build relationships. And then eventually, hopefully at the end of this funnel, you're going to matriculate as a recruit at some of these places. So it's really important to cast a wide net. When you make initial contact with coaches, you're going to write via email and you're going to send all of the things that we just mentioned, your resume, your recruiting video, you're going to fill out their questionnaire, you're going to make contact with the coach. This is the most nerving part for students, a nerving part for students. But what do I say? How do I put it? I don't want to sound braggy. What should I put in there? Okay. First, I think it's really helpful to write a personalized introduction email. Tell them where you are, tell them the class, tell them your GPA, right? Tell them about your curriculum, give them your summer plans. And then if you have time, put one to two personalized sentences about the college. So I've been researching Chapman and his volleyball program. I love the smaller campus size and the business. And I know Jane Smith, who's on your team right now, because that builds a connection. Here's my game footage. Here's my athletic profile. Please let me know of my next steps. Okay. So you're soliciting feedback from, or you're actually sending out this initial email. And then if they reach back out to you, you're going to send, you're going to solicit feedback from them. What did you think of my film? How did you think I did? What can I improve on? And that's how you go about making initial contact with coaches. In the next phase, you're going to research and follow up know and follow the teams that you're interested in, right? Know their conference standings, um, read about them in the news, read about the coach's profile and what they're all about, right? You're kind of learning in this phase too, you're gathering more in-depth information about that college and whether or not that school is a good fit for you. The more contact you have with that coach, the more that you build that relationship, the more memorable you become, and the more you know if you're a good fit for their program just as much as they're a good fit for you, okay? The next thing I'm going to challenge you to do is actually to schedule an, a phone call with the coach. And this trips students up all the time. You send out your initial email, they write you back and they say, hey, let's chat on the phone and students freeze. They're like, what am I going to say about myself? What do I even ask? Okay. When you set up that initial phone call, you're gathering more information. Here are some important questions to ask about the recruiting process. Have you watched my video? If not, when will you, right? Do you think I can play for your school? Again, pretty uncomfortable question to ask, 
but really helpful in knowing about your strengths and your weaknesses and what you can work on and how that coach can help you grow as an athlete. Asking the coach about their recruiting process and timeline, asking right up front, like, hey, should I be reaching out to you? When will you get back to me? Um, and you'll be able to tell by the coach's tone if they're really excited about you or if they're kind of like, we'll get back to you. Okay. You can kind of tell that. What positions are you recruiting for? And do you see me in those positions? And then last but not least, what are my next steps? Okay. The only person that's going to advocate for you in this process to the actual coaches beyond your coaches is yourself. So you have to ask these tough questions so you know where you stand. Okay. But these are just some ideas to, to drive the conversation for the college coach. I always like to ask, or I always liked when students asked me, what are you looking for in a student athlete? What are you look? What positions are you looking to fill? And do you see? How do you see my role on your team? Okay, trust me, they're just these recruiting calls are just as awkward for the coach as they are for the student. But once you get to know people, it's a lot easier. And that brings us into phase three, where you're building relationships. By now, you've had a couple of email exchanges back and forth. Maybe you've met with the coach and you've attended their, their um, like a clinic or a summer showcase, right? Um, you've maybe reached out to some of their team, team members. And now you're starting to like build these rela relationships. So it's not uncommon for you to reach out to your college coaches after notable moments in your games during your season. You're following up with your top schools on uh, via email, and you're also maybe following them on social media to follow their season. So if a coach calls you and, and is talking to you, you can say, hey, I heard you beat Claremont McKenna last week. That was awesome, right? And then they know that you're interested in them. You're gonna keep them updated on your test scores and grades. You're going to visit the college, maybe both unofficially and officially, but you're building relationships with these coaches, these players, these colleges, so that you can tell if you're going to be a great fit for that school. Then in the final countdown, the last part, you have a finalized list of 10 to 12 colleges, reach target and likely some of them may be strictly academic at this point, and that's completely okay. I have students that say, you know, I really wanna stay in California. I'd love to run track, but if it only happens at, you know, University of San Diego, San Diego State or Cal Poly, I'm completely okay with that. But I want to stay in California. These are the three schools that are still that I'm still on their radar. Maybe it will work out, maybe it won't, and that's okay. So again, your priorities shift throughout the process. And especially with COVID, it, it, it's just going to be an ever-changing and ongoing process, right? The other thing you're going to do is develop this application strategy. They may ask you to apply early decision, early action versus regular decision. And I think as a family, as a student, you just have to be prepared for that. You may be able to say, you know what? I'm not gonna apply early decision because I'm interested in five other schools and I just wanna see how this all plays out. Or you may decide, yes, this is my top choice school. I'm applying early decision. If I get in there, I'm committing. Okay, and that's a conversation you're going to have in your senior year. Maybe you visit or and do official visits in your senior year. Once you apply, I think the other important piece is to let the college coach know when your application is submitted so that he or she can go to bat for you in admission. Right. I think that's a really important thing. At the end, you're going to review offers, acceptances, review your scholarships, and then eventually commit and deposit. So I think if there's one takeaway or a couple of takeaways from this process is you'll get the most out of this process if you are coachable, if you're flexible, if you're open and, and honest, if you, and if you advocate for yourself. This is such a fun ride and you can learn so much athletically from some of the best coaches in the nation. And so what an amazing opportunity to attend their camps, to attend their clinics and just have fun. 
if you are there, they're watching you. They're not only watching you as you play technically on the field, but they're watching how you interact with other people. They're watching how you interact with coaches. So just know to be your genuine self and to really just put yourself out there. The second thing is to be confident in your abilities as a player and advocate for those abilities. Don't be afraid to say, I can bring a lot to your team. I've watched X, Y, and Z, and I really think on offense, I can score goals and finish, right? Coaches love that. They want somebody who wants to do well. So don't be afraid to brag a little and advocate for yourself. Four, stay organized and make sure that you're responding in a timely manner. You don't wanna let four months go by before you respond to a a coach's email. So if you're unsure of what to say, reach out to your coach, reach out to your high school coach, reach out to your parents, say, I don't know how to respond to this, but do so within 24 to 48 hours, because I think that is also says a lot about your character. And number five, I think just remember you guys, where there is a will, there is a way. There are 3000 colleges out there. There's over 1100 institutions NCAA wise that offer sports. And I think there are so many opportunities that students overlook. So just because you've never heard of a school, don't rule that out as a possibility. If you wanna play, there is a school out there for you. Okay? So I hope this was helpful. Um, After tonight's presentation, I am going to send you a list of resources, the College Bound Student Athlete Guide, which I think is awesome and a great reference. I'm going to send you the spreadsheet that I use with my student athletes um, to keep organized and keep coaches' contacts together and make sure that you're responding to them in that timely manner. And then I'm also going to um, send out a list of resources, ncaa.org, .com, NCAA, it has the Eligibility Center, Um, website on there, just helpful websites that you can go to to start building your college list and find sports um, within those areas. So if you have any questions, you know, I would love to answer them. I tried to keep it under an hour. I think I'm right under there. So that's great. Um, so please let me know. You could put in the chat or the Q&A if you have any questions. I will also send these slides because I know I went through some of these quickly. And if this is your first time hearing all of this information, it could be a little overwhelming. So Jenny, I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Um, Can you talk a little bit about um, what an early read might look like and how how coaches can sometimes get that for students Um, and also just about like recruiting trips and when does that typically happen and, you know, what might go on on a recruiting trip? Absolutely. So an early read is, is going to happen. Um, <clears throat> typically once you start contact with your coaches and you're sending them your information, you can send them like your transcript and your test scores, and they will, will take your transcript and test scores to admissions with them and give, give, and your activities and things like that, and give admissions a full picture of who you are as a student. And they can give an early read on that application and, and let you, or on, on your information and let you know, you know, if you're in the wheelhouse, right? Places like Stanford or I don't know who else, a lot of other colleges do this. They actually have student athletes apply over the summer. So their student athletes get like this bright fuchsia 
envelope in the mail. It's it, it used to be an envelope. I don't know what they do now because <laughs> it's like past paper, but you get um, an early application and you have to submit by a certain date over the summer and admissions goes through and will tell you whether or not they've been accepted or not accepted. And so you will know going into your senior year if you'd been admitted to that school and whether or not you're the, you, you know, you're, you, you've made the cut. Okay. So, um, I know like I've had student athletes that I've worked with in the past who one who played hockey field hockey at Stanford, who that was the experience there. And then most recently, um, one of the former athletes I've coached in field hockey as well had the same thing with, um, Drexel. And so they applied over the summer and got an early read and an early acceptance. So, and accepted in that first first round. So that's kind of what an early read looks like um, in terms of student athletes in those highly selective schools. And then the second thing was about recruiting trips, right? And what those kind of look like. So in terms of recruiting trips and, and going, going to visit schools, I typically tell students, if you're going on a college tour or you're going on a college visit and you want to visit the school unofficially, you can schedule a time to meet with the, with the college coach or just say, hey, I'm going to be on campus. Send an email and say, I'm going to be on campus at this time and date. Are you available to meet? And if it's within the timelines of those recruiting calendars, most of the time college coaches will set aside a time to meet with you. And when I used to recruit student athletes, I would actually um, schedule a tour with one of my current athletes and have uh, one of the girls walk the pro prospective student athlete and their family around campus. So they had a chance to get to know some of my athletes. And, and then we would even like set up a lunch with the team or um, an event for them to kind of get a feel for what our team had to offer. So unofficially, um, if you're going to be on that college campus, I think it's worth to re worth it to reach out to the coach and just let them know that you're going to be there because they can meet with you and tell you more about the program and they can meet with you face to face. If a coach offers you an official visit, then they are pretty much paying for everything when you get onto campus. So you may stay with the team overnight. You may come to one of their recruiting days, watch them play, go to go to lunch with the players. Um, you can actually do an overnight visit and spend, spend the night there and kind of get a feel for the team. And I think this is a great way to try on a team and know whether or not the student athletes are happy there. Um, do they like the coach? You know, is is the coach building this program? And you can kind of see uh, the climate of the school and if these people are the right fit for you. Um, I know I just went through the, this with my niece and my nephew. Want, my niece played field hockey. She's playing Division III um, in, in Pennsylvania. And she went to a number of schools and did all of these visits where she was like, I want to come and visit. Let's set up a time. And she would spend the night and then immediately know, like, these aren't my people. Or yes, I can see myself here, right? I think that's a great way to find the fit. Um, and so I think those visits are super helpful. I also think it's really great way to see the team in action and know like what you can bring to that team and see if you can compete at that level. So coaches will reach out and try to get you to campus in, in a variety of ways, or even this year virtually via Zoom. I've had a lot of coaches sit with um, student athletes via Zoom and meet people um, and have a panel of students as well because they couldn't get there physically. They were doing these virtual sessions with athletes as well. Does that answer your question? Yes. Awesome. Any other questions?
you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A if you have any follow-up questions. Okay, so I...